this is part two of erythropoiesis. We did part one, which was our uh, granulopoiesis or leukopoiesis um, with emphasis on granulopoiesis. And then this is erythropoiesis. And so this is the production of red blood cells. Um, towards the end of this PowerPoint, I'm going to also talk about um, platelet production, thrombopoiesis, thrombocytopoiesis. Um, but we'll ta start out talking about red blood cells. Erythropoiesin is, er, erythropoiesis excuse me, is the formation and development of erythrocytes, which are also known as red blood cells. Um, part of that process, really important part of that process, is the release uh, and production and release of erythropoietin. This is a hormone, if you remember back to comparative anatomy, when we talked about the renal system. Um, erythropoietin is a hormone that's produced by the kidneys that stimulates erythropoiesis or stimulates red blood cell production. So in the little diagrams down at the bottom of the slide here, we see that healthy kidneys are going to produce erythropoietin. Um, sometimes that's abbreviated EPO or EPO. Um, and this is going to stimulate the bone marrow to make red blood cells. And red blood cells are obviously needed to carry oxygen throughout the body. And that's the, the whole point of uh, red blood cell production in general is to carry oxygen on the hemoglobin to tissues um, throughout the body and then help to um, rid the body of excess carbon dioxide that is a result of uh, just regular cell metabolism. Uh, in the case of kidney disease, you know, especially chronic renal disease uh, that we see in our, our mammal patients especially, um, those diseased kidneys are not making enough erythropoietin or EPO. And the bone marrow then is not going to be stimulated as much to make as much red blood cells. And so over time, you will get a chronic um, non-regenerative anemia that happens as a de decrease in the amount of erythropoietin being released. So it's really interesting, I think, how the kidneys and the bone um, marrow are so closely related. It doesn't make intuitive sense when you think kidneys and bones, but they are very tightly related. Just for interest's sake, um, here's a slide on the uh, lifespans of the different red blood cells. Most commonly, um, we'll talk about dog red blood cells and their lifespans about 120 days, about uh, uh, 68 days in the cat. Large animals, those vary, but from about 100 to 160 days, our pocket pets have a very short lifespan of uh, red blood cells, which is uh, 40 to 70, and then the avian also a very short lifespan, less than 50 days for those cells. And so there's constantly the need for erythropoietin to be released into the bloodstream to travel to the bone marrow to stimulate more red blood cell production. So before um, an animal is born, when it's still a fetus, the spleen and the liver are um, the primary sources of erythropoiesis and hematopoiesis in general. After birth, the bone marrow is going to take over, um, and that's where the majority of erythropoiesis will happen after the birth of the uh, animal. Um, the spleen and the liver can uh, assist, like I talked about in the first PowerPoint on hematopoiesis, the spleen and the liver can be extra medullary sites of hematopoiesis and can make more red blood cells in times of need, like a you know, massive hemorrhage event or um, immune-mediated hemolytic anemia where we're getting massive destruction of red blood cells. We can have the spleen and the liver start to make more red blood cells as needed. The other interesting thing that the spleen does is it contains a storage reservoir, so it's basically like a holding tank for red blood cells. And again, in times of need, the spleen will actually contract and release those red blood cells into the bloodstream. Um, this is especially important during times of trauma that we see that happen. So in general, the younger the erythrocyte precursors are, the darker blue the cytoplasm is, and the larger the cell. 
And so this can kind of help differentiate a little bit um, from the immature granulocytes because they don't tend to be quite as deep blue purple in the cytoplasm. They definitely do have a darker blue cytoplasm than we're used to seeing in white blood cells. Um, but the, the erythrocytes are just a deep, intense, intense blue color. So if we walk our way through the slide, the slide here, um, letter A is our rubroblast, and that's the earliest stage of red blood cell after the, um, the stem cell. Uh, letter B here is our prorubrocyte, and um, we can see the cell starting to become a little bit smaller. The nucleus is starting to condense a little bit. C and D are both rubrocytes, and C is just a slightly less mature, more immature, younger, if you will, um, rubrocyte than D is. But you can see those that nucleus starting to tighten down even more, get a little bit more clumped. Um, by the time we get to E, which is where we have our metarubrocytes, or nucleated red blood cells, um, you can see that nucleus is very small and condensed, almost black in color, and we have uh, generally the overall cell size has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. And then finally, F is our polychromatophil or our reticulocyte. Um, if we stained it with new methylene blue, we would see that it's a reticulocyte, and um, that's just leftover DNA that gets an RNA that gets left in there that um, creates that kind of purpley color to the cell. Here's our erythropoiesis, again, um, starting with the rubroblast, going to the prorubrocyte. Um, and then we have the rubrocyte, we've got a couple of stages of that. And then we have our metarubrocyte, and that's when we have that dark purple nucleus. Um, and then you might end up with a howl jolly body or two, and then your polychromatophil, and finally your erythrocyte, a red blood cell. So let's start back at the rubroblast stage. It's really hard to say, rubroblast. Um, so this is a cell that has a very large round nucleus. Um, most of their blast cells do have big round nuclei. And um, the nucleus is going to be a little bit reddish in tone. Um, and again, that fine chromatin pattern. Sometimes nucleoli are present. But the, the characteristic um, of this cell is that deeply basophilic, very, very blue cytoplasm um, with just a relatively small amount around the nucleus. So we have a large nucleus um, and a relatively small amount of cytoplasm in this rubroblast. Now as the cell starts to mature, the nucleus starts to get smaller. And so we have a larger volume of cytoplasm as compared to nucleus here. Um, the nucleus is still going to be pretty large and round. The chromatin pattern is going to start to get a little clumpier, a little more coarse. Um, and usually there are no nucleoli in this cell. Uh, the cytoplasm is still very dark bluish purple. And, um, and now there's just kind of a small amount around the nucleus, but a little bit more than we were used to seeing with the rubroblast rubro stage. That's the prorubrocyte. Next we have the rubrocyte, and this starts the cell type that you are more likely to see in circulation. Um, we have a round nucleus again. We're starting to get really clumpy, coarse chromatin. Sometimes it'll even look like a, a, like a wagon wheel, um, and that's getting kind of a deep blue-purple in color. And that nucleus is getting smaller and smaller and more condensed. You're going to have a larger um, amount of cytoplasm in these cells. And they're still going to be staining kind of a blue, blue-gray, pink, blue-gray color, kind of purple. Um, and this is when we start to get hemoglobin production, these red blood cells. So this is a cell that can be somewhat functional because there's hemoglobin production going on here. Um, and then we have an increase in the amount of cytoplasm as compared to the nucleus. So the cell's getting smaller, but the nucleus is getting smaller faster, I guess. Um, so we have a little bit more cytoplasm. Um, but we're heading towards that erythrocyte size and shape and color.
Metarubrocyte, these are also known as nucleated red blood cells or NRBCs, and these are extremely common to see in circulation. Um, it's normal to see a few or one or two on a blood smear. You may not see them in a normal patient, but it, it, you may, um, and that's okay. If you start to see less of them, however, that is indicative of um, regeneration of the bone marrow or sometimes some other stuff going on. So here's some images where we have this very small, round, dark nucleus. Sometimes it will almost look black. Um, and this is, and usually they're kind of off to one side. May even start to be um, kind of pushed or extruded out of the cell a little bit, because that's eventually what's going to happen is that nucleus is going to get pushed out of the cell. The cytoplasm here has more um, hemoglobin in it, so it's going to stain more pinkish than blue, um, but it will still have some blue left. But the key is those very small, dark nuclei sort of sitting eccentrically or over off to one side of the cell. Once that nucleus gets pushed out of the cell, what we're left with is um, a relatively large erythrocyte. Um, this is sometimes called diffusely basophilic or my favorite polychromatophil, because I think that's more descriptive. And then if we stain with nemethylene blue, like in the bottom right side here, and see the, um, the um, RNA picking up the nemethylene blue stain, those are going to be reticulocytes. There will not be a nucleus in these cells. Sometimes we'll have a halogolly body left over, but no nucleus. And the cytoplasm is going to have a little bit of a blue tint to it. It's going to be mostly trending towards pink but it's gonna have a little bit of a blue tint because we still do have a little bit of uh, RNA left in the cell. And then finally, our mature erythrocytes or red blood cells. Again, no nucleus. We should have a pink or orange uh, cytoplasm with um, about a third of that cell being represented by a central pallor. And we're going to have that biconcave disc shape in dogs and cats, and that's pretty important um, when we're looking at morphology, especially in the dog and the cat. So here's another step-by-step -step of the erythroid series, starting with the ruboblast there on the left. A prorubrocyte is our next cell. Um, then we have the rubrocyte the metarubrocyte and the erythrocyte. When you see them lined up like that, they, they seem a little more straightforward, I think, than the granulocytes do. Rubroblast to prorubrocyte, you know, we have the cell getting smaller, we have a little bit more um, cytoplasm as compared to nucleus. The rubrocyte, again, that, that nucleus is really starting to condense, but it's not quite as small as in the metarubrocyte, and then that cell is starting to get smaller and smaller. Um, I think it's a little bit more clear in this, this type than we have in the others. Okay, walking you through step by step. This is a, the picture that we had earlier in the slideshow. Um, and then um, just kind of made larger. So hopefully the quality is okay on your screen of these images. But there's our ruberblast, big round nucleus with a relatively small amount of very dark blue cytoplasm surrounding. The prorubrocyte, we see that nucleus start to condense um, a little bit. We start to see some clumping in the chromatin. Still a relatively small amount of cytoplasm, um, and it's still very blue. Our rubricite, we start to get a little lightening in the cytoplasm, very um, clumpy uh, chromatin in the nucleus, maybe almost looking like a wagon wheel sometimes. Um, and then we have a little bit more mature rubricite and letter D um, there, where we have you know the cells still getting yet smaller. Um, and then our metarubrocyte on E, where those nuclei are very small, very dark, um, and the overall cytoplasm is, is decreasing in size, size as well. And then finally, polychromatophilic erythrocyte or reticulocyte. And I think you guys feel pretty comfortable identifying polychromatophils at this point. So moving on to platelets, um, so thrombopoiesis is the production of blood platelets, and megakaryocytopoiesis 
is a production of megakaryocytes, and megakaryocytes are the precursors to, um, to platelets. Now this is different because the cell size is going to increase, um, which is different than our granulocytes and our erythrocytes, um, but the cell size is going to increase as the cells mature to the megakaryocyte, and that's the largest cell in the thrombocyte production uh, pathway. And then the megakaryocyte will then divide up into the platelets. And I'll show you a picture that kind of shows that a little bit more specifically. In birds, we always call platelets thrombocytes um, because they're actual cells that are with the nucleus. All bird blood cells are uh, nucleated, uh, including the red blood cells and platelets. And so we generally will refer to bird platelets as thrombocytes and uh, bird red blood cells as erythrocytes. Um, due to the presence of those nuclei. All right, so let's talk about this cell called a megakaryoblast. And this is a precursor to the megakaryocyte. This is a pretty large cell, as you can see from the um, images down below. Um, it generally will have um, a large nucleus. And um, the nucleus can be multiple within one cell, you know, between one and four nuclei. Um, and the nu nucleoli will be oftentimes prominent, either staying very, very dark or being big um, areas with lack of color. As with most of the immature cells, the cytoplasm is going to be more blue. Um, you may have vacuoles pleasant present, um, but the interesting thing about megakaryoblasts that will differentiate them from other type of blast cells are these little blebs that, that stick out from the cell, um, stick out from the cytoplasm. And you can see both of these megakaryoblasts on the images below have little blebs coming out. And that, that's basically the beginning of platelet production um, with those blebs uh, kind of outcropping the surface of the cell. Then we have a pro-megakaryocyte, so megakaryoblast to pro-megakaryocyte. And um, now we start to see lots and lots of nuclei. So you see the cell on the left side here. We have three big giant nuclei there. Um, the one on the right has one. Looks like it's starting to divide into two, but in some cells we can have up to eight or more nuclei. Um, it can also look like a multi-lobed nucleus. And I think that might be what's happening here on the right side. Cytoplasm is going to be a little bit larger uh, in volume, and it's going to be a little bluer than the rest of the blast cell, um, but no granules. So these are pro-megakaryocytes, so they have a the distinction distinguishing characteristic with this is either multiple nuclei or like a big squashy multi-lobed nucleus. So that's going to be distingu distinguishable from other cells that will have more of a um, big round nucleus at the blast stage here and the, the, the pro myelocyte and pro rubricite will have still big round nucleus and over here I think you have a pro myelocyte on the left um, to the left of the pro megakaryocyte you have a pro myelocyte with you can see those granules starting to form And then the megakaryocyte, and you may very well see uh, occasionally a circulating megakaryocyte, especially if you have, especially if you have a patient who is um, producing an excess number of platelets, or has a really really active bone marrow that's kicking out immature cells too soon, and sometimes we'll see that with regeneration after loss of blood or. Um, white blood cells or platelets. So the megakaryocyte is a pretty impressive looking cell. Um, it has this big blobby nucleus that's multi-lobed. Nuclear mass is what I have here on the slide and it is kind of what it looks like. It's just a big blobby thing um, of nucleus and then you can see the cytoplasm is very very large and uh, it's really starting to break off into these little platelets. So um, it's generally going to be kind of a pale blue in color sometimes with some granules. And then finally, platelets look like 
uh, that megakaryocyte that was in the previous slide just kind of looks like it explodes into these mature platelets. So these are very small. They're generally about mm, a tenth the size of a canine red blood cell. Um, in the feline, we can have multiple different sizes and shapes. Remember, platelets are pleomorphic. And they look very fuzzy um, to most of our microscopes when we look at it, even on 100x. Um, the image that I have here with all the little projections sticking up, that's an electron micrograph uh, style image of a thrombocyte or a platelet. And they do, they have all these little projections all the way around, which is why they look sort of fuzzy. Um, and that's basically to help them all stick together when it's time for them to do so in, uh, in clotting. And so you will sometimes get clotting happening when you draw blood from a patient. Um, and you can see the image on the bottom right down here. We have little platelet clumps as those platelets are kind of all getting stuck together, a little platelet party, um, which is normal whenever you have trauma to the endothelial layer, um, which is the lining of the red blood, or excuse me, the lining of the um, blood vessels. So that's what's going on there. So um, our thrombocyte maturation, there's megakaryoblast, pro-megakaryocyte, megakaryocyte, and that's that big giant cell with a blobby nuclear mass, and then finally mature platelets. So a little bit fewer steps there to get to thrombocytes and platelets. So that's the end of our erythrocyte and platelet maturation. Um, hopefully you've already watched the um, granulocyte mat maturation. If you haven't, go ahead and go back and do that. Um, next we'll be working on abnormals. I'll get those up in a few days. All right, thanks guys. Bye.